But the pandemic has presented with myriad uh, challenges along the way. And it's been two years of different kinds of, tra- of challenges. Initially, it was different, and it's different. Then a, a month later, two months later, it's different now. It's an ongoing series of challenges. And each time, we have to figure out what's what's happening here. What do I need to do to get through this? And that's why it's kind of exhausting, too. But that's what gets us through. Hi, I'm Sophie McBain. I'm a special correspondent for New Statesman. And today I'm really pleased to be speaking to George Bonanno. He is a professor of clinical psychology and the director of the Lost Trauma and Emotion Lab at Teachers College at New York's Columbia University. And he's recently published a book called The End of Trauma, How the New Science of Resilience Changes How We Think About PTSD. And in it, he looks at why some people, and in fact, a majority of people, don't, who experience really extreme trauma and really difficult events don't actually suffer long-term psychological symptoms. Um, and he draws on research like his um, longitudinal studies into the trajectories of 9-11 survivors who ended up suffering from prolonged trauma and who was ended up being more resilient. And I was really keen to be speaking to you today, George, because um, I feel in the UK and I think probably in lots of countries at the moment, people have had a really tough few years because of the pandemic. And some people are hearing the news about this new variant and might feel that they're reaching a breaking point or they're feeling just really scared about what it would mean to live under restrictions again, to possibly have another lockdown again. Um, to experience that return of really intense health anxiety, um, worrying about their loved ones. Um, And so, um, yeah, I really look forward to speaking to you about resilience. And I thought maybe one good place to start was to be clear. I think some people think of resilience as not feeling emotion or just kind of gritting your teeth and, and grinning and bearing it. And that's not what resilience means to you. What what do you mean when you talk about people who are resilient to traumatic events? Well, uh, Sophie, first of all, it's nice to meet you. Um, and so when when I talk about resilience and what we've done, really, we've we've done research on this idea for almost three decades now. So it's all informed by this long series of research studies we've done. And resilience is really, I think of it as an outcome. So people are not resilient, they're resilient to something. And when they've shown a healthy outcome afterwards, they're showing that resilient outcome. And uh, we've been documenting that for three decades. It's prevalent, as you said. And we're now, you know, for the last several decades, at least, we've been trying to understand how it works. And it's more than, as you said, gritting your teeth and bearing it. It's more, it doesn't just happen. It's an active process. Most people, this is a really important piece of this puzzle. Most people get very upset when something happens to them. I refer to most of these these kind of events as potentially traumatic events. And most people, when they're exposed to something really difficult, life-threatening or, you know, um, prolonged, they, they get pretty upset in the beginning. And that's quite natural in that those upset reactions might intrude, include intrusive thoughts about the event. We don't want to have them, nightmares even, being on edge for a while. All those are pretty natural. They happen with with most people exposed to these kind of events. And they, I think, are adaptive. They help us deal with it. They help us think about it, focus on it, process it. And that can last anywhere from a couple hours to a couple weeks. And it usually runs its course. And, you know, sometimes it lasts longer. So for most people, the majority in all our studies show this resilient response, but they do not simply grin and bear it. They they, and they do not show or have a free ride through the event. They get upset, and they have to kind of work it through and process it. I'm not sure about work, working through is the best phrase, but they do have to kind of process it and, and deal with the event and find the best way to cope with it. And related to that, and also to sort of clear up a misconception as well, um, people will sometimes think of resilience as a character trait, or they link it to specific character traits like thinking oh well if you're more religious then you find it easier to cope with adversity or if you're a naturally optimistic person um but that's something that you don't think is that's something you think we tend to get wrong about what resilience is yes absolutely so i mean we tend to assume 
that resilient people are a specific type and they have the four or five magic traits. You see lots of this in the media, but you also see books about this, the three traits, the five traits, the five traits, the six traits, the seven traits of highly resilient people. There's a there's a bit of truth in that, in that these different traits that, that are often bandied about in these articles and books, they are useful tools. So being optimistic is a useful tool. Being social and having connections with other people is definitely a useful tool. Um, but that's what they are. They're tools. And each time, and we found in our research over and over that these tools are simply not enough. What we need to do when we're exposed to one of these kinds of events is we need to then assess the event and try to figure out what's going to fit for this event because every one of these difficulties we go through is different. Potentially traumatic events are all different. The, the pandemic, as you opened talking about, the pandemic is presented with myriad uh, challenges along the way. And it's been two years of different kinds of tra of challenges. Initially, it was different, then it's different. Then a, a month later, two months later, it's different now. It's an ongoing series of challenges. And each time, we have to figure out what's what's happening here. What do I need to do to get through this? And that's why it's kind of exhausting, too. But that's what gets us through. Yeah. And so people now who are thinking about no, is there going to be another lockdown? Is there going to be a really catastrophic another wave? Um, they they don't need to be thinking about do I have this kind of inherent toolbox that will help me cope? But I think the thing that you talk about a lot is the importance of having a flexibility uh, mindset. That that is what helps people adapt and and move through difficult circumstances. And I wondered if you could explain that a little bit Yeah, more. sure. I mean, that's, I've called this broad kind of what process we do flexibility. It has at least two parts that I've been defining in it that have some empirical reality. We see this in the research. And one is a mindset. It's a way of thinking that just basically says, you know, I'll, I'll get through this. I, I, I will have do it. I have the tools. And I, you know, I need to focus on what I need to do here. That's a way of thinking, which I call the flexibility mindset. It's the idea that you can kind of bend and 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 go along with whatever's happening and work it out. And that's actually pretty common. Most people, in fact, have at least the ingredients for this. And um, I try to explicitly lay it out so people maybe get a little bit more sense of control over it. But that's what most people end up doing. They end up working it out. And we've seen this from the beginning of the pandemic till now, that people have endured and endured really well. And they, so we have that mindset, whether we realize it or not, we, we sort of get in there and do it. And, um, and then, you know, once we're in, the, in there doing it, once we're on the field, once we're in the kitchen, whatever we're doing to make the, the, the dinner, we just had Thanksgiving holiday here, which is, requires an enormous amount of cooking. It's a big feast. And we, we have to get in that kitchen and do it. Right. And once we're in the kitchen, once we're on the field, then we can kind of work it out. What do I need to do here? Which tools are going to work for this situation? And that seems to be pretty much what resilient people do, what people do. And doing those kind of things gets us through the event, one event at a time. And are there things you can do to try and learn that ability? Yeah, I think so. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I wanted to, um, to put this on the table in a sense, to alert people to this is how this seems to work, and this is what you may be doing already, and if not, here's how, what you can try to do. And there, you know, I think all of these things are learnable. We've seen that they are learnable, all the different pieces. In the book, I've suggested some self-talk, ways we can speak to ourselves, which is actually very effective. There's a lot of research on self-talk. It works. So you might say to yourself if to, to, to engender optimism or even to remind yourself to be optimistic that, you know, it'll be okay. This will, in fact, be okay. Right now, you mentioned it seems like another lockdown. Oh, my God, I just don't have the strength to go through it. But we will go through it because we have no choice. And we will dig in and we will deal with it. And that's what we do. That's what humans have always done. And so we can remind ourselves it's going to be okay. I'm not going to pretend it's not happening, but it's going to be okay. And, you know, uh, so, so we might ask, well, what is, what's happening exactly? What is the, the thing I'm trying to deal with? Is it I'm exhausted? Is it that I, I, I have to put on all the, the masks and everything again? And, you know, 
you know, do all the jump through all the hoops just to do my job, or maybe I have to continue not having enough money to get by. Whatever those things are, we have to define that for ourselves, and then we we have to ask ourselves: So, what's happening? What do I need to do? What am I able to do? And then a crucial part of this whole flexibility piece is actually monitoring it and correcting it. We try something, it may not work. Nobody's perfect. Nobody knows exactly what's going to help in every situation. We try something out and we pay attention. If it works, great. I found something that helps in this situation. If it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. We try something else. We have a toolbox. We have different we all have different tools we can use. And these are relatively simple straightforward steps we all probably do already, but I've, I've tried to lay them out so people can like understand it better and maybe enhance them. Yeah. And one phrase you use that really resonated with me and that I feel like might resonate with lots of people who you know, in the lockdown felt like everyone else was learning how to make perfect sourdough or like going on 20 kilometer runs. And in fact, you just needed to watch trashy TV and have a big gin and tonic every evening <laughs> is the phrase coping ugly. Um, and I wondered if you could speak a bit about coping ugly. Yeah, well, I, I coined that phrase, I don't know, quite a while ago now, about, I guess, 12 years ago. So I wrote a book about bereavement and when I first sort of began to think about the idea. And it's since been applied, applied in many of the ways, actually about 20 years ago. And um, the, the meaning of this really is that it doesn't have to be pretty what you do. It doesn't have to be considered by some expert like me or anybody else the right thing to do. It just has to work. So having a drink, you know, most experts on coping would not say, don't have a drink, or they wouldn't say necessarily, I think you should drink tonight. Maybe drink a lot tonight. <laughs> no, that's not a thing you would hear. Or, you know, spend two days binge watching absolutely trash movies. But if it works for you, if it gets your mind off it, if it distracts you, if it makes you feel relaxed, do it. You know, it's it. that's what I call coping ugly. And sometimes people will think of things that they never would have even dreamed of doing, but it works. And that's the thing. And I'd like to quote John Lennon here, who's famously said, he had a song, whatever gets you through the night. And that's what we're aiming for. Whatever gets you through this moment, then you're on the other side, then you have the next moment. And life is just filled with moment after moment. And that's what humans do. So try whatever's going to work. And it's okay. It's okay by me. I'm an expert. It's okay by me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you were in um, New York in the spring. I was reading about that in your book. And I was actually there as well. And you know, we both know it was this kind of extremely harrowing period. Did you have, did you, were you coping ugly? Did What was your coping ugly Mechanism. Um, yes, indeed. In fact, I, I, I was asked to speak about that a lot at the time. This is in, in April, I think, in New York. We had 800 people dying a day in New York City. And down the street from my apartment was a refrigerator truck for, it was a mobile morgue that they've set up right down the street. And in Central Park, near where I lived, there were hospital tents. And I, mean, I, I have to remember now what I did, but I watched a lot of bad movies. I mean, I did whatever I could do. I exercised, I exercised a lot. Um, you know, really whatever, I, I actually don't remember too much about whatever I was doing, but I rode my bicycle. That's one of the things I did. I rode my bicycle all around New York City every day, miles and miles, because there were no cars. I rode right down the middle of Times Square, which is usually always packed with people and cars. And I just rode right down the middle, down Broadway, pretty much every day, because it was so much fun to do that. I don't think that was necessarily coping ugly, but it was a different kind of coping than I'd ever used before. It's too dangerous to do that normally. We just think of something, I'm going to try this, and it made me feel great, so I kept doing it. That's the nature of this phenomenon. Whatever works to get you through the situation, you have to kind of think it through, what should I do here? What can I do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there a danger that if we talk about, talk too much about the pandemic being very traumatic or the next wave being something that people are going to find very difficult, that it can become a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, that part of the key to resilience is emphasizing that you know, we, we can get through this. Yeah, I mean, the crux of it again is whatever is going to work. If, if talking about it is helpful, do it. But if talking about it, you know, feel, makes you feel frightened or makes you feel down, stop doing that. You know, again, what, the reason watching movies, bad movies or any kind of movies can be useful is it gets your mind off it. 
And if that that's generally a pretty good coping mechanism. And if it works in some situations, in some situations that won't work, in some situations or at some point in a situation, you, there are points when we have to really focus ourselves and say, this is pretty bad. So what do I need to do here? We need to get our ducks in a row, as was we might say in, in, in America. We have to get our ducks in a row and figure out what we need to do here. But then once we do that, we get a plan of action, whatever we, we decide, then there's plenty of time to distract yourself and just keep yourself on an even keel. Make sure you're getting enough sleep. Maybe, you know, do things to, to you know, to just help you through the day. And that, then that can be anything. But I think, yeah, talking about it a lot, probably in a prolonged way is not so healthy. Yeah, you know, I, one yeah. of the things I decided, if you don't mind me mentioning it, I decided early on to stop reading the newspapers all day long, reading the online news. No offense to your your magazine has got to make a living, I'm aware. But, you know, I, I basically would get in the morning, read for a little bit to know what's going on. Um, and then I would just say, rest of the day, I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to go there on my computer or anything because I don't want to keep thinking about this. Yeah. I mean, I think lots of people were like that, but also there was almost kind of two coping mechanisms. Like my husband was, he wanted to stop reading the news completely. And I became completely obsessed with reading every single statistic and fact I could possibly read about what was going on. And I suppose, I mean, maybe that was both of us coping, coping ugly in our different ways. But um, I know that your lab has been looking at resilience during the pandemic as well, hasn't it? Including in China, and I was wondering what what kind of findings you you had come across. Well, what we found is almost what we always find, which is very interesting. Um, there's been a pattern with the pandemic. In the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of increase in anxiety and depression, and then for some people there was, and then it gradually went, gradually abated, it gradually reduced. To where now most people it's it's moderate to mild and it's pretty low. But we we mapped different trajectories. We found that the majority of people showed the resilience trajectory we've seen so many times in other research. That is, they have relatively low anxiety and depression symptoms, or or whatever symptoms we might measure: low anxiety, depression, distress, etc. Um, and then we all also saw, and we've now done this in the United States, China, Poland, and Israel. And we're doing another study in Israel now, and we're doing we're trying to get get going another study in the United States. Studies like this have also been done in the United Kingdom, several of them, where people are tracked over time, and these different patterns are mapped. And the patterns always show that the resilience trajectory, low symptoms throughout, is the most common response. These studies have also shown that the highest levels of symptoms, kind of what we normally think as you know, a pretty serious psychological condition, are no more prevalent than they are normally. But there, there are more, there's somewhat more people in the middle. That's one of the differences we've seen. And that makes perfect sense. This is a, a mild to moderate chronic stressor. This is not a traumatic event for most people, the pandemic. That's really clear. It's not, doesn't meet what we would normally think of as a traumatic event. Um, I can talk about that if, if there's interest, but it's really a, a, a chronic stressor that's not extreme, but mild, and, you know, it's wearing us out. That's what it is. And so we see that in the data as well. I mean, I think that's a very good point, isn't it? That for some people, I mean, obviously, if you've lost a loved one, or if you're someone who has been self-isolating for a long time because you're very immunocompromised and are just completely cut off socially, then that can be, I mean, bereavement, something extremely difficult and traumatic. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of us, it's it's more a sort of abstract, well, not abstract, but um, just a sort of global anxiety and uncertainty and stress about, am I going to catch it? Is my job okay? Um, mm -hmm. what's going to happen next. Yeah. And I think it's not extreme for most people, but it's it's definitely present. And the other thing, though, that is happening during the pandemic, there is a general increase in physical complaints. And that makes perfect sense because that's what stress does. Stress wears us out, our body wears out our body. Um, and, you know, we, we are getting to this. We can't probably do this forever. If we did, maybe it would just become life. And I hope that doesn't happen. I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, it's, it's what we've been dealing with for a long time now. I think one thing you also noted before is that sometimes the kind of psychological surveys that you get um, 
will slightly end up overstating the extent to which people's suffering has um would, would count as ang- having an anxiety disorder or having depression because actually if, you know, if, if you're in New York in, in spring 2020 and you're having trouble sleeping and have a very persistent low mood that's probably quite a normal yes. response to what's going on yeah yeah and the, the one there are some groups as you mentioned people who've lost loved ones um, people are very worried about their economic situation or who have lost their livelihood. And there is another group that's suffered actually quite a bit, and that's frontline medical providers. They've been completely maxed out. They've been beyond capacity. And that's a stressful job under normal circumstances. We did some research there, and I collaborated with some people who work in, in the emergency departments. That's what we call them here. And you, may, you may have the same phrase in England. And those people, th- those jobs have a lot of stress normally, but during the pandemic, it's been really off the charts, and th- it shows. I mean, it's a it's a tough life, and you know those that particular group of people has suffered. I think that kind of also brings us a little bit to some of the some people have a um, a bit of a dislike for the term resilience now because they think of it as stop blaming the ability to cope or not to cope on someone's character or someone's resilience when the focus should be on like not build a more resilient healthcare uh, sector but let's kind of fix all these policy problems that have made it so difficult for doctors and nurses yeah. i sh- i moment. share that that actually i share that um, that uh, reaction i wish i never used the term we started using the term way back when, when it wasn't used at all in this context. And we kind of, I suppose, you can blame me for that term. And, um, you know, it's not wasn't a new term, but it was, had been applied to these kind of events before in adults. And I don't think it's a very good term, and it's actually kind of lost its meaning. And, I mean, I don't have anything better at the moment, but, you know, I, I share some of that disappointment with that, that, that phrase. It doesn't quite get us where we're going. That it sort of individualizes a problem in a way that what should be a kind of social problem is then being talked about more in the... There are different levels to it. And certainly the social side of it is very, or the more societal level is very important. It is, it is up to individuals as well, but it's not about their inherent capacities. It's about what they do in the sort of when, in the moment. Um, But you're right. It actually, it, it definitely involves societal issues. And, you know, I think this pandemic has already change some things and hopefully it will change a lot more by the time we're through with it in terms of society the way society thinks about these kinds of issues and just as a final question um i was interested to know what what brought you to the idea of studying resilience in the first place it's something you've i think three decades of of research now into this concept and i wondered what had have brought you to studying that in the first place? and Well, it, it, it actually was, I, I don't know if it, I want to say accidental, but it kind of happened to me. So I, was, I began studying bereavement and then moved into studying trauma. And in all those studies, we did things a little bit different than other researchers had. We, at the time, those, those type of events, loss or trauma, were studied primarily among people who, who broke down and who could not function anymore, which is a very important thing to study, but it's, it also excludes the rest of the picture. So simply, we just set out to, 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 to kind of follow everybody we could who had gone through one of those events as soon as we could afterwards. And we also used more contemporary techniques, I think. We, I knew a lot about experimental psychology and things, and you know I, that was my background. But we began to follow people over time, and then we simply saw that most people were resilient. And we actually didn't use the word yet. And we, were, we had some debate. As I said, I think I lobbied hard for the word resilience. My colleagues were, were not so sure about it. But we, we, we documented it and published it, and then we did it again and documented and published it. So we just kept seeing it. But you know, it wasn't necessarily that I set out to demonstrate that because I, I didn't really know. But this is what the data shows over and over. So we just simply saw it. We, can, we created the studies to see it, and we saw it. So what were the alternative words that, that were being suggested? For, no. <laughs> for... Well, as a research nerd, I would have said a stable trajectory of healthy functioning, right? But you can't <laughs> quite, that's not going to get very much mileage, you know? It's, it's a kind of a 
mouthful to say. So, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I don't have one right now. I think, you know, because the resilience idea has just sort of dominated so much. I can, I can work on it and let you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, this is something you've been studying since the early, for, since the nineties. Is that right? Um, so since um, the, like 1991, I began studying this. So yeah, totally. exactly 30 years ago at this point. And you were studying, were you studying it at Columbia the whole, no, whole time? No, I, I had got my PhD from Yale University and I decided I needed to change direction because I'd been doing more experimental things and I was trained as a clinical psychologist too. So I wanted to do more of that. And I was offered a position to study bereavement in San Francisco at the, the, the big university there, the University of California, San Francisco. It's a magnificent university. And this is actually part of the story, but I didn't know much about bereavement. And so when I did look into the literature, and I wasn't keen on the idea of studying bereavement, when I looked into the literature, I was very much surprised to see that it was a very much outdated literature. And it was fixated on this one point of studying people who couldn't recover, which, as I said before, is, is a valid and important thing to study. But we immediately set out to try to you know, broaden the picture. So that's how I got into it. And then I moved eventually, probably 10 years later, I detoured to an university in Washington and then came to Columbia. And I came to Columbia in 1999, just before the 9-11 attacks. Oh, gosh, yeah. For people now who are feeling extremely stressed and worried about what the next few months are going to entail, um, the, the underlying message is that Yes, this is something extremely stressful and we've all been experiencing stress for quite a long time related to this. And obviously some people have been experiencing much worse than that. But the thing to remember is that most people do have the the tools to cope and it's about trying to be able to focus on your ability to cope. Yeah, and I think I would add to that, it may seem like just too much, but that's how it felt from the beginning. And we got through it, and we got through it again and again through each wave, and we'll get through it this time. We don't have much choice, so we'll we'll get through it, and we always do, and humans always do, and we we do it the same way. We look at the tools we have, figure out what's going to work in that situation, and we and we try it out. Yeah. Well, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much. Um, Really enjoyed our conversation. Sure, my pleasure. Very nice to meet you. So if you enjoyed this interview, you can see more on the New Statesman website and our YouTube channel.